Hola, bienvenidos todos. Um, it's a cold and rainy day here in Seattle, so that is a perfect time to dream about being in Spain next year, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, so for today's demo, this is going to be um, a sketch of this view. This is in the Royal Alcázar in Sevilla, and it's one of the places that we'll visit next year. This is a building that dates back to the 10th century when it was a Moorish fort. And then this particular building was started in the 14th century um, uh, as the, the royal house. And in fact, apparently, the royal family still stays on the upper floors of this space uh, when they're in town. So um, anyway, it's a beautiful example of the architecture in Sevilla. And this is one of the reasons why I selected this place as a workshop location. It's just, um, it's a really beautiful, beautiful city and the architecture is incredible. So, um, so let's talk about doing this view. Now, typically we would be out um, you know, drawing live, but this is the next best thing. We can still practice and learn from doing demos from photos. Uh, but, you know, in in reality, the real thing is so much better. And I will, as I go through this, I will talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we would do in reality versus what we're doing here on a in a studio setting. Um, but it, whether we're sitting in front of this space for real or working from a photo, the first thing that I will do is do an analysis of this view. Now, you guys probably know I'm trained as an architect and uh, a lot of sketchers would probably begin this drawing by what? What do you think? <laughs> I think they would start with the thing that catches their eye the most, which is this huge arch. That is not, in fact, where I start. I pretty much ignore all those details and start with the big shapes. And these are the the things that I try and see first, and these are the things that I draw first on the paper. And today I uh, will give you a good example of that. But let's do a little bit of an analysis. So for this, in the studio, I put a piece of um, tracing paper down over this photo. And if we're gonna start with a big shape, um, the first one I see and the biggest one that I see is this back wall. So let's just go from corner to corner and draw in this back wall. I'm going to the underside of the roof, corner here, I'm ignoring all the details, and to here. So already I can tell this is a little wider than it is tall. And I have to say that when I'm sketching in the field or doing any kind of sketching, I always look for squares because it's it's harder to measure this length versus this length. It's easier to kind of see where there's a square. So I grab a piece of paper, scrap piece of paper for that. And I just kind of measure this. In the field, I would do this with my pencil. I'll close one eye and do this with my pencil. And then I drop it, so my pencil, I'm dropping my pencil, and I get the edge to right here, and lo and behold, it happens to fall on one of the columns. So that's, I'm sure, no accident. The Moors were mathematicians, and um, I'm sure everything related to geometry and math. Um, so you can see here that it's this much wider than a square, and that is gonna help me when I transfer this information to my sketchbook. Okay, so number one, the first thing I look for is the big shape. So that's here, big shape. The second thing I look for are uh, is a vanishing point. This is a one point perspective because we're sitting and looking squarely at the face of this building, of this courtyard. And um, so where would the vanishing point be? It's where the lines of the edges that are moving away from me as I sit here and draw, where they appear to converge. This is like a, an interesting thing that our eyes do, that in order to perceive space, we, we see lines that are in reality parallel to each other, they're equally distant, appear to be converging in the distance. And then um, lines that are parallel to each other converge to the same 
point in the distance. So I'm just looking at, I'm just grabbing some of these lines and let's see if we can find a vanishing point. And maybe I'll take this one. Now I'll come to this side. It's good to do both sides to really check what you're doing. And let's take the top of this railing. I guess just extend it. And you can start to see there's a vanishing point appearing. And it's right there. So that is our number two. Our vanishing point. The vanishing point is usually right in front of me. So if I draw my head in here, there's my hairdo. <laughs> um, it's right, at, it's a little high actually, it's right at the height of my eyes um, above the ground. And it also happens to be the height of all these people. You will see that the heads of all these people, including this person, if you were a little taller, um, all line up on that on that line, which I'm now going to draw in in red, which is step three, and that is the eye level line. The eye level line. So basically, these are the three steps that I use that I do to draw any sketch that I do. I look for the big shapes. I look for squares within those big shapes. And then I extend lines that are diminishing away from me to find the vanishing point. And then I draw in the eye level line because it's such a useful reference. If I wanted to draw in people in the background, they're all here. If I wanted to add some people in the foreground, all those heads align. No matter where they are, they could be way off in the distance. And if the ground is flat and they're about as tall as I am, give or take a six inches or a foot, um, their heads are all going to line on that eye level line. So, um, so those are the first steps. Then I also, I'll just talk a little bit moving ahead a little bit. I also then break these big shapes down into smaller shapes. So I can also see a big line here. I can see that it's just over half the way up. And locating that line there is going to help me with my sketch. So, uh, oh, one other thing to notice, this vanishing point is right in the center, the center of the face of this building. So that's another way to help locate the vanishing point when I sketch and that it's very low to the ground. If this is the ground line, the vanishing point and eye level line are really, really low. Most people make a mistake of putting it too high in their sketch and then it looks like they've sprouted wings and they're floating. The eye level and the vanishing point are often very, very low. So that's how the analysis works. Next, I'm going to start to transfer some of this to my sketchbook. Okay, let's talk about how to transfer all this information to a sketchbook. Let me take this off and I'm going to pull this off as well so that I can make a little space. There's that. Now, what are the tools that I use for sketching? Um, for the drawing portion, I'm gonna use this mechanical pencil. It's a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil with 2B lead in it. And I use mechanical pencils because there is no good sharpener other than an electric one, which doesn't really work when you're sketching in the field. Uh, the sketchbook I'm gonna use is this Hanamula. Zoom out. This Hanamula sketchbook. And I like it because the paper is actually pretty good and um, it's light. The other one that I use is Pentalic Aqua Journal, and I've used these for years, and I really like the weight of the paper. They're nice, heavy, um, heavy, true 140-pound paper. Um, but I'm using the Hanamula because, you see, there's a little more height here, 
And that's going to help me in terms of working it on a square because our, our overall format is pretty much square. So instead of squishing it a little bit, I'm going to use the Hanamula and give myself a little more room. I also, oh, sorry, <laughs> those, are, those are sketches from Italy. <laughs> I'll just show you one right there. Um, I use um, these handy dandy clips to help hold my paper down. Uh, and uh, that's super useful. Now I'm going to ideally put this in such a way where you can see both my sketchbook and this reference photo. So I'm going to zoom out and move up a little bit and hope that that works. Okay. Just rearranging a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like filming live. <laughs> all right, so there's that. Hopefully you can see all that. And here, I'll just zoom out a little bit more. And slide that over. All right, hopefully that works. Sorry for taking time to make these adjustments. Okay. All right. Let's let's get going with this sketch. Um, and here's my reference information. Okay. I could, in fact, start with the frame, like the square frame around the image. But uh, I'm not going to do that because we don't really have a frame when we work in the field. So instead, I'm going to try and transfer these one, two, three things on paper. One, two, three things there to my sketchbook. And that's how we'll start this sketch. Now, how big I make that first shape is going to determine a lot of things. If I make it this big, that square shape plus a little, I'm not going to have much room for the walls and the space um, on my paper. So I need to make it smaller. If I make it too small, it's gonna look like it's in a tunnel, at the end of a tunnel. Then I get too much of the side walls. So it's a little like Goldilocks, we have to find the sweet spot. And I'm also gonna use a kneaded eraser, forgot to mention that. And my triangle. I actually do use a triangle for doing straight edges. Usually I start my sketch completely freehand. Um, but um, as I start to clean things up, I, I use my straight edge um, of this triangle. And this is, I think, about eight inches in this dimension. No, this dimension here. All right, so let's see if we can find that sweet spot. And. I need to allow a little room for sky and for that uh, piece, that cupola piece on top. And I draw lightly using light construction lines. I'm going to slide it over because I want it centered on my paper. And let's see if that's, let me start this, get the square. I'll go back to my scrap piece of paper. If this is my height here, there's my square, and then plus a little bit for an extra bay. So that is, is that going to do it? Let's try it. That's roughly the shape. Now I, I kind of drew these lines a little darker than I normally would so that you could see them. So I'll erase some of them out. But basically, I'm gonna go with this shape. Okay, so there's step one. Now, let's find the vanishing point. And as we see here, the vanishing point is in the middle, in the center in this direction, and just a little bit above eye level. I could measure all that, but it gets a little tedious. Quarter, another half there. I could divide that into quarters, and it's a little below that. 
I'm just going to eyeball it and say it's right about here. And that's probably going to be just close enough. So that means a person standing back there is about that big. And then it's in the center of this. And I'm eyeballing that. It's not the center of my square. It's the center of my rectangle. So I'm going to place the vanishing point right about there. Is it perfect? Maybe not but it won't really matter too much. It's, it's definitely close enough. So now I start breaking down that shape. Well, actually, let me back up a little bit. I'm gonna draw the, get some of these sidewalls in so that you can start to see the sense of the space of this courtyard. And here. So there are the walls. And then the sky is going to be up here, and this um, cupola, th octagonal cupola is going to be at the top there. Okay, the next big line we saw, remember, was this one. It was just, just a little bit over halfway up. So if I eyeball halfway up, take that line a little bit up here. And this is, this is where that roof is in there. And I'm going to bring it around, hits the corner and is translated into this wall in perspective. Now, I draw a lot in my sketches. I, I like seeing the line work. I love the line work, in fact. Um, some sketchers draw very little and then go immediately to painting. Some draw in pencil and then take a little time to ink or a lot of time to ink. Uh, but I like pencil. I love the feel of it on the paper. It's quick. I can make lines that are dark. I can make lines that are light. And um, it just gives me a lot of flexibility. Okay, so now let's start to divide this up a little bit more. We've got this, something like this here. We've got one, two, then a wide one, and then one, two. So let's see if I can just kind of eyeball what that might look like. See, I'm using my straight edge because it helps speed things up. If you find the straight edge slows you down, then don't use it. But there, I've got, I've got those columns divided. And then we're gonna have this part here, the spring line for the arches. During the workshop, I will talk tons about arches and what um, what makes an arch versus a horseshoe. So I get one arch here. And they're pretty tall pointed arches. I'm just blocking in these basic shapes. And we're getting a tall one here, it comes up and then it pops up here. Another one here. All these heights should align there and there and here it's really hard to make a symmetrical arch to i the line i make here is easy the line i make here is hard <laughs> and they're often you have to kind of watch that they don't become too lopsided um okay those are there are those arches now i'm gonna use these corners to translate in perspective there's the top of the arch from the vanishing point to the corner and up. And on this side, corner and up. And I'm just gonna eyeball these in. So I get, in my view, I have one arch here. It's very shallow and a space. Another one here. We'll go into this a lot um, in my online classes. I do a deep dive into arches. But here we're just going to do this and eyeball that. And it's the same thing on this side, even though it's super washed out in the light. Two and three. And then we get the edge of the paper. So that's where it's just going to blend out. Now a lot of these construction lines you see in the drawing, I do not erase those. I keep them in and they just kind of disappear when you don't want to see them and then they appear when you do. So um, that's pretty handy. 
All right, let me get a little bit of this roof in. So here's the top of the arch, here's the underside. There's a little bit of roof that runs along here and you will notice that directly above the vanishing point, that roof is straight up, the, the ridges of the tiles in the line are straight up and down. And then they gradually get angled like this as they come around to the edge. And then we get a little overhang here on this face. And all I see there is the little bit of the ends of the tiles. And I actually see some of that here too. You'll notice I'm not drawing every single one in. In fact, I'll liven this up a little bit by being a little more uh, loose about it there here it's important to for the materials to read and then here just a little bit of that sense and then we do see the underside of the roof here so i'm just going to draw these lines in oh, actually they go the other direction ha huh. and here go up now we can see a little bit more of them and they get wider and the spacing is wider the further toward toward more towards me it comes and the further out it goes okay then we have a balustrade and then we have more arches up here I might need to add a little roof not a big deal there's a little more roof. There's a little more roof. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight arches up there. I love even numbers <laughs> because it's so easy to just divide things in half. So here's half. Um, here's half of the half. And here's half of the half of the half. <laughs> half, half, half. And now I should have, even though it's eyeballed, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bays. Yay! All right, I need the top of the arch, the spring line of the arch, the balustrade is here. And I'm also noticing this shape here. And that's wider than it is tall. So it's a rectangle. And that is, in fact, what I show is they're rectangles. Then there are little arches in here. And I'm just simplifying a lot of this. I'm not going to go crazy over all this detail. Actually, these have two. Then a single and a single. And two at the corner. And then let's just draw this. Well, it looks to be just about a half circle in for the arches. There, and then there's a little bit of detailing above it, which will show in pencil. There's even a little doohickey there. That's a technical architecture term, doohickey. <laughs> And then I need to um, bring this over to the side here. So the spring line gets transferred and the top of the arches gets transferred. And I'm gonna eyeball that again. There's one, two, these are actual ellipses. I could even sketch in that whole ellipse for the arch. So that's one, two, three. These need to get a little wider. And same thing on this side. All right, one here. And another one here. And you'll see I'm not even drawing them that carefully. It's just kind of there. There's also 
a thickness to that wall. So we need to get that in as well. And maybe, no, there. And the arch is down here. I mean, the column is down there. Thickness to the underside. This actually has an underside as well. And then there's a thickness to the wall over here. There, the underside. Then we get a little more roof up here. And I can just indicate the tile work with this little scalloped edge. And a little bit of the roof overhang here. And some roof overhang here. You'll see that with a, a combination of the hand drawn and the or the free handed versus the and together with the straight edge, um, it still works pretty well. Um, it doesn't look like a mechanical drawing and it doesn't look like a super loose drawing. So I'm just gonna show some of this and then we get a little bit of that here too. I'm just suggesting some of that detail on the underside without drawing every single one in. Okay, and then we get this cupola portion, which that edge is halfway up here. So there's an edge. This edge is a little more than halfway across these two arches. So there, side to front. The front is a little wider. And then we get the two sides. There's this. And then this angles down and it goes around the corner. You can see it going around the edge. So it's important to get that little bit in. And we get a little bit of roof here. We get some tile. We're gonna get lots of tile in Spain. <laughs> And maybe a little, just some little vertical marks to indicate those dentals. And that is a technical architecture term. <laughs> and here we get this little finial at the top. There. Uh, there are some doors back here. Can sort of indicate some of that. And there's a door here. And you know, the best way to tell is that there's space back there is to put a person in. <laughs> there, now we know there's volume back there. And then for the rail, I just, I simplify that as well by really just sort of conveying a sense for the space in between the rail, the verticals on the rail. could draw that in, I could paint that in, but I'm just gonna draw it in. So I like drawings. There, super loose, but it's there. Now let's add a little bit more information here. We have the underside here, which I can actually see a little bit of that. There, don't wanna draw all of it in. Um, and then we get this here and let's just put, let's start here, straight edge and do put some scallops in roughly in that shape does have a little thickness to it. And then comes down here. And we get two arches, I mean two columns. Again, that's just loosely drawn in. And here, some more scallops. 
Remember, it's a, just a sketch, so we don't have to really go nuts drawing all of that in. Uh, the first time I went to Spain, I I, I, just, I love Spain. <laughs> uh, but the first time I went, I hated all my sketches. And it was because... Um, the detail, the architectural detail on the buildings was exquisite. And I didn't think my sketches captured any of it very well. And I was so frustrated. So then I come home. A month later, I look at my sketches and I think, well, you know, that, that's not that bad, really. Uh, six months later, I look at my sketches and I'm like, well, that's really pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> a year later, I look at my sketches and I'm like, damn, that looks great. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that was a big lesson um, about um, what your expectations are for your sketches. Uh, in the moment, you might not like them, but you'll get home. The memory is there. It's in your sketchbook and and that'll be all you need really you don't don't worry about the perfection or the imperfection and here i'm just kind of speeding it up giving it a thickness and those scallops look like this in terms of the thickness and let's just suggest some columns and some capitals. And there's actually another arch back here. So there's that. And there's a floor back here that we need to get in. There's the front and then there's the floor behind. And then there's even a space beyond that, that we're going to try and keep white. And then there are more people back here. Some plants, I'm going to kind of ignore that. Let's get the fountain in. And I'm looking at the fountain relative to the arch. If these are the columns, it comes in a little bit. So if that's the column, that's the column. My fountain is going to be something like this. That's the actual fountain. Moorish gardens always have water in them. And if you go to the um, Alhambra in Granada, um, the fountain, I mean, it's like Disneyland for landscape architects because the fountains are just incredible. Get that line across. Um, and there's more stuff back here too, but I'm not going to draw too much of that in. Okay, back to the water. The light is going to reflect down, and the dark darkness of the figures will reflect down as well. Now, a lot of that I'm going to paint in. Then we get the little bit of the walkway that's there. And it seems to come out like this. And back and then actually comes down and I'm not gonna get too worked up about that it's a sunken garden that's also very Moorish and then we get some trees in here so let's do add these trees they're very low give them rough edges and maybe another And then mirror it on the other side. Actually, there's that cool detail there. Don't know quite what that is. Okay. And tree in perspective. Another trunk. They're quite low. And a tree. Give it a couple of branches. Maybe a little shadow down here. And we're almost done with the sketch. And 
I'm sure there's more I can add. There are these diagonals in the detailing there, in the stucco work, but I think I might try painting that in. We'll see how that goes. And I think that's it. Maybe just another person over here, another one here. Loose people. Okay, I think that's it. There's my line drawing. I'll hold it up so you can see it a little bit better. There we go. Next will be color. Okay, and now for color. <laughs> it's both the exciting part and the really stressful part because <laughs> watercolor is just not forgiving. It's, um, you know, it's a difficult medium to use, but it's also super fun. And I have a little bug flying around. I hope he's not flying into your view here. Anyway, I wanted to show you a little bit about my equipment when I travel. So I carry one bag that's a little bigger than this for um, my sketchbook and for everything that's dry. And then I carry this little bag for my wet materials and I'll show you what's inside of it. I just got this on Amazon. Um, this is the Winsor Newton Sketchers Pocket Box. It's the one that I use. I've stuck some Velcro on here to help it attach to the lap board that I use, but I don't really need it. You can just clip it on. Um, and I haven't opened this in a little while. Um, let me talk about the colors that I use. So I have my blues, my reds, and my yellows. This is French Ultramarine, Windsor Newton, Cobalt Blue, Manganese Blue, Windsor Newton Burnt Sienna. Um, gosh, uh, Permanent Lizard Crimson, Yellow Ochre, New Gamboge, these are the, the ones on the bottom are the colors I use less. This is New Gamboge. This is Pyrrole Orange. I've just been to Texas. You can tell. Pyrrole Orange. <laughs> anyway. Um, Quinacridone Burnt Orange. This is a magic color. It's great for dropping in and creating kind of glowing effects in shade and shadow. This, I totally forgot the name because I really never use it unless there's water. And this is a graphite color that I just got at Daniel Smith that I'm hoping to experiment with. This is sap green. Lately, I've used much less sap green and I've just been mixing my own greens with blues and yellows. Um, I use this new gamboge to brighten up the greens that I mix. I like that this is super light. It's just really has the colors that I need. I can take one of my binder clips and clip it to my lap board and it has three mixing areas which are dirty at the moment um, but that's okay. And I store it in this bag with some paper towels because I can't paint unless I have a paper towel in my left hand. And then my favorite brushes. These are the Escoda travel brushes. They're, they should be in the Museum of Modern Art. They are works of great beauty. They're just unbelievable. This is the, I use the size 12 Escudo Reserva. This is the Kalinsky Sable. You definitely don't want to dig into dry paint with a beautiful brush like this. It'll ruin the bristles, which are becoming hard to come by. And then this is the synthetic one. And I actually use this probably more than the Reserva even. And this is a size 12. Actually, I generally use a size 10. I take that back. Um, but for some reason, that's a size 12. Um, and, but I love the size 12 Escoda Perla. Now, for those who might be coming to Seville next year, I, I found it generally easier to fly into Barcelona. And Barcelona is a fantastic city with a, an amazing urban sketching group. And... Um, so I will probably fly into Barcelona and well, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, but if we, I'm going to try and set up um, uh, a visit to the Escoda factory. Now I have no idea if in COVID they're going to even allow that, but um, 
but I'm, it's something I'm thinking about. And I've been there before. It's a fabulous place to visit. It's a wonderful family-run business. Um, the grandsons run it now, and they're just as nice as can be. And again, it's just the most fantastic brush. Beautifully weighted, just closes. Oh, I can say nothing but great things about it. All right, let me see. Let me check my camera and see if you can see all of this. I think, I hope you can. All right, so let's just start with some painting. Now, normally I tilt my paper up like this a little bit, but I'm leaving it fairly flat. My desktop is tilted a little bit, but I'm so, but I'm leaving it fairly flat, but um, the tilt really helps because gravity helps to pull your watercolors down. And in general, that's, that's a good thing. Oh, I forgot. I also usually have a little scrap piece of paper to use as, as a test. So I'll throw that in there too, because you may have noticed like real watercolorists just go from their palette straight to their painting. Uh, apparently I'm not a real watercolorist because I can't do that to save my soul. It freaks me out too much. I kind of want to see sometimes the, the color before I put it on. All right, um, I'm going to start with the sky. Um, because in general, uh, when I paint, I work my way from the back to the front and from the lightest values to the darkest values. So let's start with a little bit of sky. I'm just gonna pre-wet this paper. And this is gonna be loose, sketchy washes. Imagine there's a tour, tour group that's hot on your heels and you're about to lose your view as you're sitting at the Alcázar attempting to sketch. Um, well, you just have to be able to paint fast. That's all there is to it. So let's try some cobalt blue. And cobalt blue tends to sit where it's placed. So as you can see, it doesn't travel. But I want to just suggest a, some clouds or something to liven it up. So I pick up my brush quite a bit. Let's work that in a little. And this blue is going to help to pop pop out the lighter building. I could drop some other colors into that. I could use more water or more pigment. I'm going to lighten up that edge a little bit. It's just distracting shape. And I think I need to fill in here just a little. There. So there's my sky. While that's drying, I go for yellow ochre. Usually I do some sort of underpainting in yellow ochre. Uh, sometimes I pre-wet the paper, but I don't think I will here. Now I'm going to try and leave all these parts where the sun is hitting white. So for the white of the paper. But you can see here already, it, this looks like a yellow ochre. I mean, that color is really strong. And here this looks like a yellow ochre with a little quinacridone burnt orange dropped into it. So that's what I'm going to try and do. And I'm not going to even paint around shapes. I'm still just paint like I draw the big shapes, I paint the big shapes. So let's see what happens. Just sort of paint through this. You know, anytime any artist does a demo, they're always winging it. <laughs> when, when they sketch in front of people, it's it's really can be stressful. <laughs> All right, I'm going to paint the shadow coming across to here. I'm going to paint this with the yellow, and I'm just painting right through all this stuff, leaving a few spots that are white. And it comes down here. Maybe I'll even go ahead and paint a little bit of this texture in. There. There's a little yellow shadow here. There's a little, going to be a little shadow under here and under here. And some under here. And I'm also going to paint the back side of this with some yellow ochre. So look how much paint I already have on, on the sketch, just using the yellow ochre. 
and the blue. All right, and oh, I think I'll paint in here a little bit. And the underside of this, give it some yellow because it's got a lot of bounced light. All right, let's then, well, while that's drying, I'm going to paint a little bit of the um, backside of the openings the, of these arches here. And let's, let's just see what happens. I'm going to try, whoa, try some yellow ochre and then see what happens if I drop in a little quinacridone burnt orange. Yep, that'll work. Now, do I want it darker at the top or darker at the bottom? I don't know. Here, I'll do it here too. And I still have plenty on my brush because it's such a tiny sketch. There. A little more quinacridone burnt orange. I can always build up more contrast a little later. Now, this hasn't dried, but I'm going to put it in anyway. That's too strong. And this is really wet here, but I'm still going to drop it in. Okay, let's get the underside of these arches too. All right, it's still drying, but I want to start working into this, so I'm working quickly. Let's mix a color. There's a color that I call Magic Gray. That is, let me slide this down. Oh, I'm getting an accident. Yo! I'll just lift a little bit of that out. Get that sloppy water out. Oh, so it goes. Um, okay, Magic Gray. And the way I make it is I go to my French Ultramarine, and I drop that in. Then I go to Burnt Sienna and add that to make a nice gray. But you can see it's kind of a, I hope you can see it's sort of a bluish gray. And to that I add about three molecules of Permanent Alizarin Crimson, and it turns it a beautiful... Well, that's pretty gray. It needs a little more blue. Turns it a beautiful blue purple gray. <laughs> Which if there's ever, you know, if Daniel Smith ever chooses to make a gray with my name on it, <laughs> I'm going to call it magic gray because it's this all-purpose color I use for a million things. Let me just make it a little denser. And I just massage it. If I put in, like I just did, too much of the red, I add more blue, and so on. Now I'm going to gray it down a little bit, because I think I'm going to make the, have this color lean a little more to the gray to go over all these yellows. Okay, so let's see where what we can do now. Um... Well, I want to create a sense for the underside here. So let's see. I'm going to make it dark at the top and try and leave it fairly light underneath towards the ground. And here, I have to remember to leave that white at the back. And here. And if I work quickly enough, I can drop in some Quinacridone burnt orange. But I might not be working quickly enough. Okay, I clean my brush, pick up some Quin burnt orange, and let's see. Nope, I think I might have missed my opportunity. I can add a little bit in. Okay. I can take that same purple and I'm going to darken the underside up here, which is still a little wet. Oh, great. The phone.
And that was a spam call. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just can't win. <laughs> there, I'll put a little bit in here too. Oh, you know, it looked better with just the orange. Let's go back and put a little more orange in. Too much orange. No, just keep working it. That's too much. I have to lift that out. You do notice I'm trying to leave the columns white as much as possible. All right, I think I'm just going to let this dry. Now I'm going to make it a little browner. That same color, I make sort of a dark brown with some more burnt sienna and French ultramarine. And I'm going to use this for these dark wood areas. I see, I'm splattering. So here, I'm going to break it up a little bit so that it's not just a straight hard line there and some here I'm an impatient painter maybe you can tell I can't sit in one spot for too long um, I admire people who can but it's super handy when you know you're traveling it's good to be able to work fast and here let's get some underside here there and that's still wet so I'm not going to touch it now um And I am going to need to cast some shadow over here. You know what? I'm going to use this color and see if I can darken this a little bit. It's just a little too bright to be in shade. All right, so that has to dry. I need to get these two planes to read a separate. So I'm just gonna work a little color into this edge and let the rest of it be white because it's really at the edge where the shapes are defined. Well, let's work a little bit on this ground down here maybe. Throw in a little of my augmented magic gray so that it sinks. And allows this plane to look like it's um, look like it's above everything, which it is. All right, now it's drying. I'm gonna take a little more quinacridone, burnt orange, and see if I can cat and a little yellow. Let's throw some yellow in it and see if I can manage to cast a little shadow, glowing shadow here. And a little bit more in here and here a little shadow underneath and here this is quite red I actually don't have a true red in my palette I tend to kind of mix a red with the colors that I have and here some dots here well it's starting to come along needs to dry. I can add a little more. Let's add some more darkness. A little more brown. I use more pigment and less water towards the end of my sketch. Um, and a way to build up the dark values. And this is where my impatience really shows. And It's really going. Let's add some texture here. I'm trying to tell, I think that tile doesn't actually even look like a red tile. It looks kind of like a gray tile. Oh. A 
in there. And whoops, that just kind of wasn't dry. Spread that around a little bit. Well, while all that's drying, and I'm liking it so far, it's actually pretty loose, um, but which I like. Let's do a little bit of the water. And you know, for this, I think I am going to uh, maybe try some of this turquoisey color. So I'm going to wet wet this first with clear water. And I'm going to make it darker here and lighter there. And I definitely need to leave the reflection white. Let me see. If I add a little bit of yellow up here, and then it goes into clear water. Oop. Let's just do that. Water has to look spontaneous and fresh, and that's so hard to do. Nope, that's too turquoisey. Let's add some cobalt blue to it. And maybe even a little ultramarine. Just pick any color. And, oh, it's drying, so I better work fast. Usually, you want it reflecting the sky. And I've just about got too much in there. See if we can deepen it a little down here. Hmm. I'm gonna leave it like that for the first layer and let it dry. Let's mix a little green while we're waiting. I'm going for my yellow ochre, my ultra French ultramarine. Brighten it up with a little bit of new gamboge and darken it back down with a little more blue. I'm going to take some of my yellow ochre and new gamboge and pretend like the sun is hitting these along that edge and make this one, it's not quite green enough. Maybe I will pick up some sap green, a little green here, and then these are just all green. So there's a little bit of sun-kissed tree there, a shrub. I'm going to take some straight up French ultramarine and just drop it in here to darken it a little on the underside and just to make it a little more varied. Uh, let's see, it's still drying. I think I'm going to add a little bit of quinacridone burnt orange to the underside here because I just really want to see the underside of the arch. There the arch is. It's on the right side in this direction and on the left side here because of where the vanishing point is. That adds just a little a little more contrast which is good. And I'll add a little under here too. And here. That's a little bit better. Still waiting for this to dry. Maybe add a little under there. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to darken in this arch here. Let's make it um, magic gray. Pick up my three colors. and get it a little darker. This is the kind of thing that you can see really well in person. <laughs> That's a little hard to convey uh, on our, under all these bright lights. So watercolor is transparent, so I can just go right over all that and get the dark ground, dark ground in there. And while it's wet, I'm going to try and drop a little in here. Uh, 
That's always the hardest part, water. Huh. Probably should have just left it. But there. Okay. You know, I am almost done. I'm going to call it quits pretty soon. I'm going to define that a little bit. Let's add some dark people here. So add a little to the people. Of course, the paint is still wet, so I have to really watch it. And anybody who's ever taken my craftsy classes knows that I often add a little bit of pyrrole orange near the vanishing point. So let's try it. I haven't done that in a while. Let's try it. Helps to just brighten things up and makes it feel like it's busy and there are people there. It's just a great color to drop in. There, maybe add a little there. Whoops. Okay. Um, one last thing. I think I'm going to add a little... A little red because this walkway by the fountain really is pretty red. But keep it loose. Okay, nope, one more thing. Just a little dark under here. And there. Usually if you have to stop and think about what to do next, it's time to stop. <laughs> so maybe I'll stop. Look at all my colors just bleeding all over the place. Impatient sketching for sure. And I'm just going to... That's just a little too bright. Okay. I could just keep adding things forever, but I think I'm going to stop because most of the color's in. So now what I do is I sign it. Sometimes I turn it on its side to sign it. Let's try that. And then I put a little wash of color over it. So a line here, I'm going to call it Demo for Sevilla, join me. <laughs> and today is the 6th, 6th November. We are so itching to get out there and sketch, aren't we? Gosh. So here it is. Oh, my last tip I forgot is take a little bit of yellow ochre or gray and paint over your text or your pencil lines and it fixes the pencil work so it will not smear. And right here where I can see that edge, I'm going to lighten it. I can even dab it a little bit so it's the paint over it is not too noticeable. So there it is, my quick sloppy painting job. <laughs> but um, gosh, it really makes me want to be sitting there and sketching live in Sevilla. I really hope some of you will consider joining us. I, I can't say enough things about it. Brenda came to me and asked, where in the world would you want to teach? And I, I, for some reason, Seville popped into my mind. Uh, not for some reason. It's a fantastic city and the food is amazing. The colors are amazing. It's just, it's the heart and soul of Spain. So um, anyway, thank you so much for joining me. This has been fun to do and fun to dream about next year. Think about um, being in Seville. So happy sketching everybody. Stay well. Bye. Ciao. Nos vemos.